Hey everyone, Will here. Welcome to 2024. Thank you all for your continued support of EMS Cast. We do this for you, the listeners, and the providers out in communities around the world. We have a lot of great ideas cooking for this upcoming year. Before we dive into this episode, we want to give you some updates. Soon you'll start to hear ads during EMS Cast. This has been a deliberate decision by Ross and me. Ads generate revenue for the podcast, and with that revenue, we can offload some of the work which Ross and I currently shoulder alone. With help, we can focus on interviewing great experts and provide great educational content. If you're ever looking for more information on any of our episodes, head to our website, emspodcast.com. There you can find our show notes and supporting information from each episode. If you want to get in touch with us, you can find our email addresses on the website, or you can message us on Instagram. And while you're on Instagram, follow us. It's a great way to know when new episodes are dropping. Finally, about this episode. To kick off 2024, this episode is a different format. Instead of a short education on a topic, we're going to play an interview we recorded with someone who is important to EMS in North Carolina. For episode 55, we interviewed retired flight paramedic Jim Barrick. Jim was in a small group of the first flight paramedics in the state of North Carolina. His 37 years of experience in EMS and critical care transport make him a wealth of wisdom. We sat down with him in the kitchen of his North Carolina home to learn a thing or two. No matter who you are or your EMS experience or background, I promise you will get some wisdom from Jim. And now, episode 56. Here you on eight. Here you on eight. Okay, you're clear. Stand by for your base. Welcome to EMS Cast, where we provide high-level education for you, the providers on the street. Uh, I'm your host, Will Barry. Every now and then in our career, we meet someone that causes us to pause. We pause because we want to stop and listen to what they're saying. In that moment, we get out of our head and our ego, and we evaluate our practice and our attitude. The stories they tell can be rich with lessons that need to be passed along. In EMS, we can feel like we're the first person to ever learn a hard lesson. It's unique. You have a ton of responsibility and you execute your duties alone or only with a partner. Often it can feel like all the hard lessons and the good ones were written just for you. Then you talk to someone that's had the same experience and you realize you're not alone. Today, we're gonna sit down with retired flight paramedic, Jim Barrick. He was a flight medic in North Carolina with Carolina Air Care since its inception. So Jim, Thanks for sitting down with us. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Where are you from and when did you first become an EMT? <laughs> the, uh, we used to say, and sometimes we're interviewing people, who are you and how did you get that way? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I live here in Hillsborough since 1984, right after I got married and moved to Hillsborough and um, grew up in Raleigh. And uh, what else do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> when did... Uh, when did you become an EMT? I became an EMT in 1978. And that was a just very, very different world. We, I was actually volunteering in the ER, and there were these people came in with these in the ambulance bringing people in and like, what is all this? And uh, started chatting with them and like, well, that sounds like that could be fun and interesting thing to do. Uh, and they told me how to, go over to South Orange Rescue and put in an application. They would call you up, and they, which they did, and um, got had a little board interview. It was a little tense, but actually pretty informal. But, you know, I think the nervousness was mostly on my part. But, uh, and I thought, so they said, yeah, come on. And it was a volunteer squad, but in those days in Orange County, North Carolina, the volunteers covered the majority of the time during the week. We had paid volunteers Monday through Friday for 12 hours, and the volunteers covered the rest of it, which tells you a lot about EMS and where it was in that time. It used to be all volunteer, and then things got to where people were leaving their job in the daytime. It was becoming problematic to provide this service, and the county started paying people to cover 
but they were really just people right out of the same squad, whether you're on the north side or the south side. They were, it was really a squad-based operation at that time. Even though they were paid, they were really more squad members than they were Orange County EMS members. But that changed over time. What, um, what were you doing in the ER? Volunteering. So would you, in a, any sort of patient care capacity? In the ER, yeah. And we, you, you know, you'd come in, do whatever they needed you to do. So we didn't even take vital signs, I don't think, but we'd just get the patient squared away or do whatever they needed to run. In those days, we had, ran, had to take all the labs and physically carry them to the, to the lab and uh, have them run. So we did a lot of scut work like that. And that was as an EMT? No, that was as a volunteer. I was just a person off the street doing that, and that's how I met the EMTs. And then they had something that was called a mobile intensive care technician. And, like, those people, you watch their, how everybody acted around like they were gods. <laughs> they were somebody special. And that just sounded like an impressive title. And I thought, well, I think I would like to be one of those people. <laughs> So where, where'd you go to paramedics, or I'm sorry, where'd you go to EMT school? I went through the county there, th- actually really through the squad. The squad, it's in North Carolina, all these things are taught through the community college system, but we never once went to the community college. It was all run through the rescue squad. And they had the resources, the equipment needed. Probably the community college didn't even have that stuff in those days. Hmm. So... We did it through the uh, rescue squad, and then we had to go t- test at the state. Did you have any friends or family that were also working no, at the rescue No, no, but squad? we made lots of good friends and people there, and we had uh, your own uh, crew within your own. We had 10 crews, so we were on once every 10 days. And if it's a weekend or Friday night, you're on for 24 hours. And did your rescue squad have an ambulance? Were you transporting patients? Oh, yeah, we were. Basically, I'm not even sure if the county actually owned any ambulances in those days. I have to think about that. They might have owned one or two. But the ambulances are all owned by the rescue squads. There are two rescue squads, North Orange County EMS on the north side and then South Orange. So we own the ambulance. And South Orange was uh, in Chapel Hill. It's a affluent university town they did not suffer for money in donations we had bought a new ambulance basically every year oh wow how old were you when you started Ooh, working a, on an ambulance now that's now you're really hmm, 78 i have to do some math here born in 51 so what how was the old does that make me 27 okay and were you hook line and sinker right away no no not at all um I was young, single, living in Bohemia, as I used to describe that era in my life. I worked uh, in a lab job, and I spent every nickel I made about as fast as I made it. I, um, at that point, started got into soccer. I was playing with two different teams, so that was six days a week I was playing soccer. Sometimes I played a pickup game on the seventh day. Working with a rescue squad, just living life and having a good time. Once you started responding to calls mm-hmm. with the rescue squad, were you, were you, you know, kind of sold out on that kind of work? No, not really. Not initially. I, I, I liked it. It was just good at that time for me. That was just a good, fun thing to do, and you could do that as a volunteer. You didn't have to do a whole lot of other stuff. And as an EMT, you didn't have a lot of con ed to go to, unlike being a paramedic, which is like, how many certifications do I have to have and maintain? Yeah, it, it was just, I was living the life and, and having a great time. And I had some great people on our squad, and we had a, our crew was just awesome. We have uh, people that have gone on to be doctors and run administration programs and so on. we had just a you look back like well that was just a stellar group of people in our squad like our crew in particular it's like wow we're just lucky yeah how how long were you doing that before you decided to become a paramedic 
Well, I, I was doing that with the idea like, well, I do want to become one of those MICTs because they're, you know, they are godlike. <laughs> so as after I became an EMT, I continued in in those days, you, be, you could work straight through and become an EMT, an intermediate, and, and it really rolls all the way into the paramedic program. So I continued to work to become an intermediate, which I did. And then I continued to become, stayed in the program and went, did more and more work to become a paramedic. And then I was, and we actually had volunteer paramedic program at that time. So we were covering, you know, the county and the, and the the citizens with paramedics are all volunteer, which in retrospect is like, that's almost unheard of. <laughs> it really is. Um, yeah, Orange County's website said they had a pretty fascinating history about being the split north and south yeah. rescue squads. And, and then the county at one point decided to that the service needed to be a little more consolidated maybe. Right, because after a while, when I became a paramedic, I started working for the county. And then I worked not in South Orange anymore, but I worked on the north side. And it was an eye-opener. There were really some very different in resources and roles that people played that was not equitable. Hmm. What What do you mean? Well, there were just a lot more resources on the north side. I mean, on the south side, better, again, an affluent university town. They had their own ambulance. They were well stocked. We didn't struggle for equipment. Like everybody, we lost equipment from here and there, but, you know, we weren't struggling. North side, very different story, quite the opposite. And when I went to work full-time on the north side, most days I was the only paramedic on the north side, and we had a much larger geographical area south side are using they're all of course county employees but they're really rescue squad people and they're running f- two trucks and four paramedics and like this is not right <laughs> and as the only paramedic if any call sounded like juicy or might be a next level thing i'd have to go and in that direction even if we weren't up so I'm driving all over the county and staying busy, and everybody else was just me. <laughs> did, did you have any humbling experiences as, like, the sole paramedic for an entire county region? Well, I think you're learning. And, that, you know, we went through that program, and we got precepted a little bit, but not like we really needed to be. And the question, who is going to precept you? And there weren't a lot of backup people to be doing that, put you with somebody else to work. That basically, I'd been working on the south side, and when I was hired, I would just put on a truck. On the north side, I didn't. I was never precepted. <laughs> Trial by fire. <laughs> yeah, we're hiring. We're going to put you on the north side you're going to work predominantly there you work some on the south side but no i work by myself on the north side once you were a paramedic running calls were you volunteering or had you become i did well that was a great question you know we working in the same environment with the same vehicle same equipment and if you got a late call and it ran over, the county didn't want to pay you for that. Because, you know, you're a volunteer, you would be there anyway, right? <laughs> well, no, because that came in 30 minutes before getting off time. And that was the sore point. But they were, truly didn't think you, they needed to pay you for your time. Because if you're coming in that night as a volunteer, you're going to be there anyway. It just sort of speaks to where you were. and I'm sure many things like that happened initially when you're just trying to get something on a service that's brand new off the ground and you're running initially an all-volunteer basis. I'm sure there are just lots of times when people didn't get paid for things like that because it's just... 
you know, you're just trying to make it work. Mm -hmm. And I come in a little behind that curve, and I'm thinking, no, you should pay me for working overtime. (laughs) Besides seeing, besides your work in the ED and seeing, or probably ER then. Mm -hmm. It was where I was working in the ER. Right. Besides seeing the mobile intensive care technician, is that mm-hmm. what yeah. North Carolina was? Yeah, yeah. So EMS, I mean, paramedics had been around, it depends on who you ask, but really kind of 1970. Early 70s in North Carolina. Okay. Did you have any sense of what a paramedic was until you started seeing them through your work in the emergency no, room? No, no, no idea. And... um is that was that a North Carolina thing calling it the mobile intensive care? It was initially, and there was a class going through the program when I walked in in '78, and I got to watch them go through the program. And you know, you're doing your own thing and progressing, and they became all mobile intensive care technicians. And our truck actually had that on the side too, and our class was the first ones that were EMT paramedic. And I felt cheated. (laughs) I wanted to be (laughs) M-I-C-T. Like, you can't do that. (laughs) How long, so you're you're working in Orange County. Um, How did air care even come about and come into the picture for you? Well, even the the person that was medical director on, on the south side was a cardiologist, Dr. Tom Griggs, awesome, awesome individual. We used to kid him that he was actually a doctor so he could support his other first responder habits, (laughs) including police as well as fire and as well as EMS. So, um, but he was heavily involved in lots of areas. A key player in, in the county, if you're trying to get something like a helicopter program started. But the helicopter program was really being started by the hospital, not the county. But Dr. Griggs covered a lot of territory. He was on the staff there. In fact, actually instrumental in getting a radio put in the CCU, where in this day and age you would never call the CCU directly. You always call the ER when you're bringing in a patient. But if you had a cardiac patient... You could call the CCU, get your orders, and the idea was that maybe these cardiac patients would go straight to the CCU. We did not have cath lab in those days, (laughs) and nothing like we have now. We take them straight upstairs. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe I took one patient straight upstairs, but it really was problematic. The person's not admitted to the hospital. You don't have all the labs. You've got to get them drawn. It really just didn't work. But he, uh, and so we had good relationship with the CCU and Dr. Griggs, obviously. The hospital wanted to start a flight program. The hospital meaning UNC, UNC. University of North yeah. Carolina. Yeah, or the North Carolina Memorial Hospital, as it was called then. Right. <laughs> but, um, and actually, North Carolina Memorial Hospitals. And I always wondered about that. Like, we just have one hospital. <laughs> you know, what is this plural? But there are obviously some long-range plans that have a children's, women's hospital, neuroscience hospital, uh, cancer hospital, that, which tells you a lot about the thinking in, in the 70s. This was a long-term plan. Part of that, then, is growth. And that hospital to grow is based in Chapel Hill, which is great, but it's a small population compared to the rest of the state. And how do you support a major hospital with no more local population than that and extend the reach. Part of that was the helicopter. Yeah. So if in, in case any listeners aren't aware, um, University of North Carolina Memorial Hospital, as it was known then, is a state-funded hospital yeah, that was created very much in so, 1952. Yeah. Uh, some of the history is not too glamorous, but North Carolina had the worst recruitment for soldiers in World War II because of the citizens' health. And so there was a initiative to create healthier citizens in North Carolina, hence the birth of 
North Carolina Memorial Hospital, the medical school, and then that became right. UNC Memorial. When the medical school was first set up, it did not have a hospital. And it really need a hospital <laughs> if you're going to have a medical school. So, yeah, there were uh, very, you look back and you go like, there's some really very progressive thinking people. Um, they were looking ahead. So North Carolina Memorial Hospital was set up to provide services that people didn't have access to. And we had a lot of very specialty things there were nowhere else in the state because of that. So we had lots of resources, but it was a state hospital, and it was not allowed in those days to compete with private hospitals, not directly. What, is that, what did that mean? Meaning if we uh, had a burn center and that got established there, if there was another burn center, that might not ever have been set up at that hospital. Hmm. And when you start marketing with a doing things like a helicopter, which is a marketing ploy. We should be honest about that. Um, are you starting to get in direct competition with other people? And that was actually a problem in the, the program getting established because we had a certificate of need system in North Carolina in those days. So the kid, instead of all the resources being in a more urban area where it's profitable and actually support them, the, the state was trying to make sure, because of what you mentioned earlier, resources got spread out across the state. So we could not be in direct competition. We didn't want to see too many resources. So you have Duke in Durham that's eight or nine miles as a crow flies away. <laughs> And they started a flight program. And so when we supply, the hospital applied for a certificate of need for an aircraft, it got turned down the first two times because of that certificate of needs system mm. that we have duplicating resources in too close of an area. Mm. And the hospital actually had to come up with a certain niche that was not provided by Duke at that time, and later East Care started up not long after Duke, uh, that other programs were not doing. And that is why there are paramedics on the helicopter. Yeah, so what was the niche that they identified? Well, they're going to do rescue. Duke would do scene work, but they did like 80% cardiac patients because they were a huge cardiac center. <laughs> but they would do some scene work, and... Uh, but we would do rescue. What? How did they define rescue? Well, rescue, you know, like we do now, we're particularly with like a helicopter, you would be taking resources. Most counties don't have a good high rescue set up. We're actually going to work with the Department of Insurance and their folks, and we're going to go to all these really nice rescue schools across the country. And like, like, man, I want to do that. <laughs> Swing out of a helicopter, you know, that repel down, that could be really cool. So they, they were, their plan was to do, like, hoist work and... and all that stuff, yeah. Wow. When, it, when did you enter into that timeline, and how did they well, how did they lure you in? After that, there was no luring. I, <laughs> I want in. <laughs> Sign me up, you know, and I wanted to, you know, apply for the job. But they got turned down, but the reason they got turned the third time was a charm, and the one is that they... We're uh, going to do this rescue. They needed the pre-hospital experience of paramedics. They were going to run a nurse-nurse program, and rescue is definitely not a nurse thing. So they changed the profile of their uh, request to put a di very different niche, and it got approved. So how many paramedics were in that first batch of paramedics and how did two alternates and a two five full-time how did you know how did you even know to apply for the job well dr griggs is mr everything in the county right <laughs> and a good friend of mine that i worked with in, in ems uh was the base supervisor on the north side so i did have 
two medics some days up there, but a lot of days I was just working by myself. And were you guys doing rescue? Oh yeah, we did everything. Now in those days, if you were daytime and let's say there was a car wreck, then we had two trucks on the north side. Somebody's turn and they went out and they, they were primary. And the other truck crew, if they were available, brought the rescue truck. And you would, you know, have the jaws of life or whatever, and you would have to do that job uh, as well. So we did all of that uh, during the daytime. Now, at nighttime, there's a separate rescue team <laughs> through, the, through the squad. So they would, the rescue people would get their truck and go, and then the EMS folks would. Okay. But most of those people covered both jobs. So when you show up on day one of being a flight paramedic with UNC, what did that look like? Oh, it was completely different landscape. I had no idea what, and I had to question myself a couple of times. What was, are you really up to this? And, um, but yeah, but there were just some terrific people. And after working by yourself with some folks that were not as stellar as you would wish they were, you get to work with some people that are really good, probably way better than you are. It was awesome. You had backup. Yeah. When you say some folks not as stellar as they should be, um, well, can I mean, you talk maybe a little as more you about wish that? you were, were they were. They were, well, I had mostly worked with EMTs, mm -hmm. so I didn't have anybody to, and you're not really being precepted. So, you know, if you had a question, you, who did you ask? Who, who did you ask? I mean, if you had a patient as the only paramedic, what would you do? You do what a reasonable and prudent person would do. <laughs> In those days, there were a lot more gray areas than they are now. It's a new industry, a new profession. A lot of questions have not been answered. In fact, if you in, initially, if you wanted to start an IV, you had to actually call the hospital and get permission. So were a lot of things at that point make base contact? Mm -hmm. So if you had a, if you really had a question or felt lost with a patient, you kind of knew you were going to be making base contact anyway. Is yeah, that you're going to call say? the hospital, but most of the time you're going to load them up. And we had this APCOR system, which was a relay system. So if you're down in a ditch or down in the woods somewhere, you could talk to the truck and the truck would relay it to the hospital. But you, it didn't always work that well. <laughs> so again... The, and, and that was part of your training. What do you do? You do what a reasonable and prudent person would do in that scenario. So sometimes you're kind of working by yourself, which was really cool and really not cool at the same time. Yeah, I have to ask, do you have any particular stories from that phase of your career where you learned a hard lesson or you had a victory of some kind? Well, I, th I guess think we consider them all <laughs> those days, if we have you made were, it to the hospital it's a victory. <laughs> but uh you know we actually uh part of duke forest is in orange county we got this group of uh challenged folks down there and they were having chest pain and getting them out of there finding them in duke forest was first of all down the path was a challenge where are they? There's no cell phone. Right. You had to go hunt them down and find them. And you had to then get them out. And you looked at this guy like, there's no way we can carry this guy, the two of us. And so you had to run back to the truck because it wouldn't work. You're too far from the repeater and all the dense vegetation. Call for what you needed. Then your partner come run back to you. And then you're trying to carry him out, you're trying to take care of him. And eventually, folks showed up and helped you carry them out. But, you know, it was just a different era. If this happened today, there would have been multiple resources paged out simultaneously. So going fast-forwarding, when you first joined Air Care, were there other flight paramedics 
in the state did you guys or the country did you guys model your program after anything specific now that i can't answer accurately as far as paramedics go no we were all brand new to this scenario on the nursing side our our, uh, lead chief flight nurse had flight experience and one other nurse did so you had started out out of 10 people eight of them are brand novices <laughs> so yeah we didn't have anybody again but it's kind of like being on the north side you didn't always have people to ask but you had somebody that was really good and you could talk about it and work with that person and over time and we would call back what training did you go through it was a six weeks of class work and uh, 244 hours in some clinical rotation. And I can remember sitting there one day, we'd come back from lunch when that little trailer was hot. And I don't know whether it was a neuro lecture, but it was like way over my head and it was just making me like question a lot of things. And that very day at lunch, we had gotten these cool little helicopter pins handed out to us. And, of course, everybody put one on their collar. You had arrived. Yes. (laughs) And I'm sitting there wondering if I've made a bad choice, and my pin falls off and goes on the floor. (laughs) I think, well, if that's not a sign, I don't know what is. (laughs) But, no, I'm not going to go back. So there's a steep learning curve, all this critical care stuff that you just, and even a lot of paramedic stuff that you got, acid base, everything else, lab base, you didn't use those. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that was good information, but how much did you retain by after a few years of never using it? So right. you had to learn a lot of information. Were they putting all of you through a training before flight operations started? Yes. And so that's that six week window there. Mm-hmm. So after six weeks, it's like, okay, here we go. We're doing this. And that was that. And then we did clinical time. And then we, you know, we're at that time, we're also, when we're not in clinical, we're still putting the program together. We're getting, you know, equipment coming in. The helicopter's not there yet. We've got to, you know, put all those things. You've got to set up a communication system. There was nothing. Did you guys, um, what did you draw from? Well, the we modeled a lot after what we did of what Duke and East Carolina were doing. And our chief flight nurse came from Duke. Hmm. And so she came with experience, and she was not a lot because Duke was only up a year and a half before we were. <laughs> so she had some. And, you know, we we were just putting it together. You're doing the best job you know how to do. I'm sure Liz and Robert Harrison, you know, Robert actually had some uh, experience. He was a director, administrator for the program, but he came from northern Virginia, and he had been a flight paramedic up there. Hmm. So we had some expertise uh, in this area, but if you add it all up, it wasn't 10 years <laughs> between all of them if you you know added them together so then what was your first shift what was your first shift like finally on the helicopter oh <laughs> well we didn't work 24 to start with we only worked 12 because that was an alien concept to a hospital and nursing so we did 12, and I was on nights first night. Hmm. But we're starting the program, and we aren't real terribly busy. I think our first 30 days, I did two transports. Because How did, we um, weren't busy at night. We were even less busy at night than we were at the daytime. And I was on nights for the whole month. <laughs> How did people know to call you? They didn't. Okay. And that was what we had to work on. So we did a lot of PR. We went down to uh, anybody that would want the helicopter and ask us, we went there. 
We did it with EMS squads, fire departments, but we also did a lot with hospitals. And we'd fly in and talk to their ER staff or whoever they had set up and explain what we were doing. What was their reaction? It varied. Okay. Yeah, varied. Some people were very excited. Other people were like, hmm. <laughs> Some people didn't think it was necessary. What was your first flight? First flight was over to a small community hospital where we got somebody off the floor, actually. And I was still struggling with motion sickness. <laughs> and I had this, we'd figured out that you needed a quarter of a scopolamine patch, not a whole one. <laughs> and you could still function. But I was so slow trying to put that IV pump on, on our little thing. And it was just, you're just struggling with everything because you've never done it. And was the equipment that was foreign to you, you know, IV, an IV pump, for example, that's something that wasn't on an ambulance then. No. Um, we counted drops. Yeah. Did you guys just take equipment from the emergency room and say, well, no, we'll try this out? No, we had our own out. equipment. Sorry, I mean... Um, were you, were you buying the same equipment as was being, used? you know, nowadays, right. There's equipment a lot is of, so specialized for, yeah. but we had our own, there weren't any really mobile IV pumps. There were pumps that would be, we used to call the difference between totable and, or, and mobile. <laughs> a lot of it was totable, but it wasn't really meant to be mobile. And so we, in fact, we didn't have a all-in-one monitor like you have now. The only thing we had was took a Life Pack Five, and we put them on the EKG. There was no vital signs taken between uh, the aircraft when we leave with them till we get to the aircraft and get them hooked up. So there's no vital signs then. You took one with their equipment, <laughs> and you know you had to do all your own drugs you know and there were there were a lot of con medications that were standard but there were a lot of medications most hospitals and other things had their own concentrations so you had to actually figure out if that's really what they were giving them and they wasn't always true yeah i can imagine that scenario um did did you feel did you have a, a flight or a call early on where you felt like, okay, this is why we're here. This is why we're making a difference or we're, we're supporting local EMS or supporting the small facilities. Every once in a while, you, you like an EMS, you do a lot of community health care. <laughs> Every once in a while you go out and you truly do something good. That makes a difference. That is somewhat true too, still with the helicopter. But one comes to mind. Uh, we went up to the north in the state, and this lady had been shot in the neck with a small caliber gun. She's awake, alert, and we're all wondering what in the world's going on with this lady's neck. <laughs> And, you know, and we just know that she's up there and we're going to go get her. And we don't really have any other information. And, like, of course, all the way up, your mind's running 100 miles an hour and you're imagining all these scenarios and what could be going on. And You walk in there and she's a very large lady. And she's talking to us. She's working to breathe. And... We had already decided that when we walked in there, we would not only take the cart kit out of the bag, but open it <laughs> and lay it out. Because <laughs> you broke the sterile on it when you did that. So that, uh, But we thought, we're going to play worst case scenario. And she included her airway. And we had to crike her. Now, I didn't actually do the procedure. My partner did, but we did it together because we were both like, do you want to do your first crike with nobody looking over your shoulder helping you? No. 
So we, you know, and we talked, went down each step by step and called out the steps and did them. And I was handed her everything as we went along and um, put this, uh, uh, we put a um, tractor and put it in and uh, saved her life. What was the referring facility like? Were they on top of her care but needing help or were they overwhelmed and they were so glad you guys showed up what was kind of the atmosphere you walked into it varied a lot it was just, um i mean we thought our er was great but it wasn't much different it just a lot smaller a lot less resources it was one say an er room but you you get the idea it it's it wasn't a lot of room it was you know their primary patient a lot of times in those days, and that was particularly true on the neonatal side of things, which we had a separate neonatal team to handle that, they didn't do anything once they called us. And so that's what was going on with this lady. What do you do with her neck? And she's swelling and she's shot. Do you going to take the initiative and crack her now or intubate her? Maybe you would because this is a potentially life-threatening problem. But who's going to do that? Because this is a weak person, and you need to do some paralytics. <laughs> and most ERs were not comfortable with that. And were you guys trained in that from the beginning? No, we were not. <laughs> and that was just, RSI was an unheard of thing in the EMS world. I mean, people knew about it, but... It, Nobody really did it, not outside the hospital. Anesthesia would do that in a major hospital. And so this lady just continued to swell up and lost her airway. But we made a difference. We, you know, she was awake talking to us when we walked in the room. She lost her airway, became unconscious, and we had to put a criker and put that in and it saved her life. She w went and talked to her the next day. The interesting thing was I expected her to wake up after Once we cracked her. Once you successfully cracked her. And gave her airway and oxygen, air, and she didn't. Were you guys always flying nurse medic at that mm -hmm. time? Yeah. We were the only nurse medic team except for then Mission. A lot of people don't understand. Mission is out of Asheville, North Carolina. They came down and trained with us the whole time. So, if, And... These are some iron men, <laughs> women. They would spend f five days down here with us doing the class, and then they go home and work in the ER or wherever. Wow. Like, that's just killer schedule. Do you have a memorable interaction with a base physician that highlighted the importance of a good relationship with your medical direction? I would imagine early on you guys were working very intimately with the doctors training you. Is that a fair this to say? This is true. We would, um, it's not, we work pretty independently now, but not so then. And, and that makes actually a lot of sense. You would not just want to train somebody, put them in this machine, fly them out there, and not have some <laughs> wonder what's going on. <laughs> out there so we always call back especially on a hospital a hospital transfer and we that was actually part of our thing we we'd split up we had two people one person would go to the doctor or nurse or whoever and get a report ultimately end up call, making the call back to the uh, our medical control officer other person would go assess the patient see if what we were told was really true and then you both compare notes and then we would make the call. She'd kind of come up with a treatment plan and then right. call Right. Well, we would oftentimes do that. If, if this is true, we're going to do this. Based on the information we told, we have some concern about what's going on. So your plan on the way down might have several forks to it. If this is true, we're going down this pathway. If this is true, we're going down this other pathway. But we always talked before we got in uh, there. 
only time you didn't have a plan when you walked in the door was a scene run because you didn't necessarily know what you're going to get. Sometimes you did, but most of the time, no. Yeah, now, you know, nurses can... Um, transport nursing is a pretty Mm well-established thing. I would imagine then, even more so now, they're heavily relying on you just to understand what the outside of hospital environment is like. And we were heavily relying on them to understand what the ICU environment was like. So we were dependent on each other. And I... I don't know what that is right there. What is that? Do you do you remember a specific like ICU experience where you were I mean some of these experiences in my short time doing this I feel very much like a fish out of water in mm-hmm. an intensive care and, unit. and very much so at that time. But you learned all that stuff and you learn and when you learn by doing you don't forget. <laughs> So you walk in and you look at that triple lumen and quad lumen, like, what is that? And, you know, the nurse was very nice to explain all this to you. (laughs) And a proximal port, what is that? Where is that exactly? What does that mean? You you know, we went over stuff like that in class somewhat, but really it was trial by fire in many ways. Similarly, these nurses had never intubated a patient. Some of them have done codes and stuff, but they're not as quick and slick as we are because that's our bread and butter. But some of them, they were very smart, very sharp, and very quick learners. And then you got to where, yeah, we'll let you intubate this patient. <laughs> because we want to, you know, it's first pass success. You And these are critical patients. You know what it's like to be a, a medic and be a preceptor or being precepted, you want to get that tube or whatever it is you're doing, but they're only going to give you so much rope. <laughs> it's very true. Did you feel, you describe a lot feeling like you were learning so much early on. Did you also feel like you brought expertise to the table? Oh, definitely, yeah, definitely. There are just lots of things we actually here in Orange County, we flew out uh, just north side of Hillsborough, actually. We're not far from where we are now. And a car wreck, and we knew that the um, power lines were down. This car had broken, hit the pole, and actually broken the lines. And so you land over there in this little tiny spot, and we get out, and we shut the aircraft down so we both go up but you know my nurse she's sharp as a tack but she's just hasn't been there and she's walking around and I said come over this way you see that burned area right there and that's a live wire <laughs> you need to come stay over here with me so yeah we, we looked after each other, mm-hmm. and that's what good partners do. You back each other up. Yeah, tell me a, another story about backing each other up. Oh, there's just many. Uh, you had to have each other's back, particularly when you went to, a lot of times in the ER, we were not always welcome. People thought we were questioning what they did, you know, people... You call the big hospital and they take your patient. You know, there really was some distrust. So when you went in there, you had to back each other up in your conversation with whomever. And there were times when physicians were really angry about how we took care of the patient and called back up and complained to medical control. And you had to tell medical control, no, it did not happen that way. Here's what really happened. Later later in your career, as you were training people, how would you 
how would you train them to handle those types of situations? Well, the, I would, you know, the way they get trained is, again, on the job training. <laughs> you talk about that before you go out and how to handle it. But it's one thing to talk about it and another thing to do it, or you get to see it in this case and witness how somebody else who's been doing the job handle the situation. And you talk about um, why you said or did certain things. Part of your, you know, as a paramedic, and in part for your own personal safety, you have to be able to read people in the situation. That's a skill that's required of you as a paramedic. And it's no different when you're going into, say, an ER or someone. You've got to be able to read the situation and read the people. And so when you're training a paramedic, they already have a good sense of that. The nurses do, too. They, they, They handle lots and lots of patients, lots of family members. They're good at it. And... You just have to say, this is what I saw. What did you see? You know, or if they ask you why you did something, you ask them, what, were you, what was your take on the situation? So, so you want to know what they're seeing and what they're thinking because that's really critical. That's what you really want to know. What are you seeing and what are you thinking? Here's what I'm seeing. Here's what I'm thinking and why. You know, and you have to kind of make sure eventually you got to all come to the same sort of understanding. <laughs> and it, it takes a little training. We, you were on probation for six months. And when you're hired at our, our program, and that's just standard employment. We figured through the six months, it took you most of the time that long to get through your training and become where you could actually function with just a two-person crew. So we really weren't getting anything benefiting it, so to speak, out of you for the first six months. We're paying you basically six months of salary. And at the end of six months, we might wash you out. No, we we didn't ever wash anybody out in six months. The program would do that long before that. What were some early indicators when people were training that they were going to be successful or unsuccessful? I think a lot of it's their comfort level. You can tell whether somebody knows their stuff and whether they don't. And if they're struggling with certain things like the monitor and other things, and it becomes obvious very quickly. And then you have to have a conversation. Let's see, what, what, do you, what are you thinking? What do you know? And are you just nervous? That's fair. People, it it's could be a stressful job. It's a, it's a fishbowl. <laughs> and people are seeing you, and you've got this flight suit on, and you're different. And some people may just be nervous. It takes some people a little longer to become more comfortable. But... You also flew as a, you had a preceptor, but you didn't always work with your partner. So other people got to see a new person. And you would just get some feedback. What are you seeing? And like, yep, I'm seeing the same thing. But if you've got a good program, uh, a good hiring program, you very seldom have to come to that situation and that's what we learned and we became changed how we interviewed and hired people so that we have a chance of having the most chance of success so that we never get in that situation as you guys started responding to more and more calls and go to some of these more high profile incidents what kind of lessons were you bringing back how were you doing process improvement uh, we, I thought we, in that early on, because such a novice crew, I thought our process review was key. We had staff meeting initially once a week, 
not once a month or every two weeks, once a week. And we reviewed every transport we did, which was great because the person who did the transport would present it and you're sitting there going through it like they did. Given this information, what am I thinking? What am I looking at? And then what did they find and do and how did they handle it? It also meant we were all getting on the same page on how to deal with this. And that included patient care or included a difficult person to work with, etc. So we reviewed every single call for probably the first six, but that was a huge learning curve. So you basically went on all the calls. We did you guys hire more people? We didn't hire any more people for a little while. We actually had one medic quit at December. We started up in July, and then we had another one leave and go to a brand new program. And that left us with three paramedics to cover the whole program. One, but we're only one helicopter. So we worked every third day during the summer. That was a long, hot summer. But we ended up, and it was also right after the uh, first person left, we advertised for uh, a flight paramedic job. And I would have killed for one, personally. And we got three applicants. Three. One was an EMT. Did that even really even count? <laughs> <laughs> not that they're not, EMTs don't count, but they just weren't even begin to be qualified for their job. So we went back and looked. We had to know like what happened and why. And there was a uh, fatal crash in North Carolina in January. And that, and we had talked to all these people doing all these outreach. And we were identifying, ooh, that guy's sharp. You know, like, we want, are you interested in flying ever? ever? You know, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and none of those people applied. So we went back and asked them. They're all worried about the crash and safety. And given what they were making there and their pay and our pay, it was, they're probably making more than we were. Who crashed? That was uh, Baptist. And Duke had crashed in August already. And that was, in fact, our very first scene call. Wow. As we went to their crash. So that was, and it's a new program and worrying about things. You know, we, that really struck a chord with us like holy cow yeah what, what kind of training were you guys getting in aviation again on job training we got some actually during our 244 hours the pilots came they talked about weather and other stuff and they talked about the radio but the, you looked at the radio and like the wolfsburg holy cow we can you know we have to actually go play with that right and so you're doing a lot of uh, training on the way, on the dead leg, either out or back, then we would sit up front and ride with the pilot, and you were a, a second set of eyes, but you also were learning about, uh, we didn't have GPS in those days. We had uh, Loran. <laughs> and how, where were you in the state of North Carolina? How, who would you contact? If you went down now, and we did a lot of exercises like that, learned to work the radio, helped with, particularly when you're flying over a controlled airspace like RDU, which is right close to us, um, you're looking for aircraft, you're also listening to the radio, making sure that you've got help from the pilot, identify all the aircraft, and you're, you know, you're a co-pilot at that point, and you learn a lot about aviation from doing that. And you could learn to read the altimeter, and you learned to read the uh, encoder and everything else, so you knew where you were. In fact, sometimes they'd let you set it up if you're good. Yeah, were the pilots leading that part of your training? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. 
Where did a lot of the first pilots come from? The first uh, two came uh, from different places. I'm actually not sure whether they were flying EMS at that time or not. I think Stan was. I'm not sure Tony was. But um, almost in those that era, virtually every EMS pilot was former Army because they're the only ones that got trained to fly a helicopter, period, but also had enough hours. Yeah, what airframe were you guys using? We used the good old BK-117 from the get-go, and it was designed to carry patients. It was a tank. It was solid, very few issues with it, and it opened, the rear doors open, and you could just slide the patient in instead of trying to spoon them in the side of the aircraft. Our loading system was so special superior to everybody else that we just beat them to death on trauma (laughs) yeah with the emphasis on scene and rescue um would you say there was a emphasis on good trauma care Mm -hmm. how did that play out well it's a difference in night and day on your orientation and what world you grew up in our competitor used all nurses. They had no pre-hospital out in front of us, which made us put us behind the curve as far as getting out there and getting people to call us. But had they done a better job, it would have made it very difficult. But they didn't understand that that person sitting there with that patient is supposed to leave in 10 minutes if and you know it didn't always happen when you're in patients trap but you have a 10 minute clock to load them up get them out of there and they would tell them they would be there in 15 minutes and then not show up for 45 and you just left that person hanging we told them we'd be there in whatever time and we were there in whatever time and we didn't spend 45 minutes on the ground intubating anybody either. We got them in and out, and we had gone. Mm-hmm. We delivered what we said we would do. Plus, we had paramedics. We knew how to talk to other paramedics. We didn't talk down to them, which is what was going on with nurses because they consider themselves higher and better than paramedics, and they did a lot of snooty stuff. And... It cost them. And then on top of that, it didn't hurt that we were good at what we did, too. It always helps to be good. We just beat the pants off of them when it came to trauma. And it, it worked. It doesn't take but really one call. You go in there and you're slick and you go in and out and you get them to do what you're supposed to do and what you said you're going to do. And in those days, we called back, which you never do now, and gave them feedback on their patient. Oh, we, we just whipped them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's something you just said that I think resonates with a lot of people, and that is it only takes one call. It only takes one call because the word gets out after that. And if you go over there and, uh, and we're user-friendly, which was not a term in those days but we made ourselves user friendly yeah even i think on you know your personal reputation which is good it's a double-edged sword but it only takes one call and And they remember that if it goes bad and they remember that person because we later when you become a supervisor you have to deal with that and you know you have to remind people why we're there we're there to help that patient regardless of how, what that other person is doing or thinking. My first thing is, when I walk in, was what do you need us to do? Hmm. What can we do to help you? What do you need us to do? Not, we're taking over the patient, not listening or even getting a report from you, but it's a, what do you want us to do? And a lot of times, you know, like, RSI would be great, <laughs> especially once we got that. But I think, and there are other people that wouldn't do this, but you realize, and you get to know all these people too, you see them repeat 
calls and you, you, you learn about them and you know them and you know that this guy could intubate them if he had RSI. So I would let them intubate. I would push the drugs and say, you ready? All right. And that, I think, just put it over the top for them because you knew they could do it. And now they got a chance to see it. And once you realize, the first time I did RSI in the field, I went, oh, my. This is so easy. (laughs) (laughs) Compared to what you would have to go through without RSI to try to intubate somebody, like, they might not be 100% down. What, What was the call? It was just some sort of trauma patient, and I don't even remember, but I do remember the people, and I remember being in their truck, and I said, do you want to intubate him? I mean, why not? He's sitting there at the head. I know he's good. He's got all the stuff, the lines there. Don't move. It's the most efficient way to do it. You tube him, I'll push the drugs. <laughs> And we've been doing it for a while, so we're comfortable. I, I would have never done that on the first one. <laughs> sure, sure. Knowing that I was going to talk to you, I talked to some other folks. Oh, you did? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got real dirt. <laughs> it's all probably true, some of it. <laughs> no, one of the things that I heard that resonated with me was that you were you were always on top of your gear. Oh, uh, well, it's... You ever had something fail that you needed? You know, and you can't make this stuff roadside. If it breaks or you lose it or something, you are just out of luck. And what do you do when you need something like that and it breaks? Early on, we didn't have backup equipment. We didn't even have backup cables. So if you broke an EKG cable, we were really, especially with a life pack five, we had to go around the hospital, beg, bar, and steal, because in those days, not even the co-carts weren't standardized. So you might find a life pack five somewhere, and then you'd have to steal her cable or borrow it or something. But you had to hunt. Anytime something broke, you had to hunt, fix it, because you, you didn't have your equipment. It was... We only had one. You had to take care of it. And you had to make sure it was ready. And the same way you go on a scene call. You you know what? We're going to hook up this, that. We're going to have all the EKG out. We're going to have the stickies on them. We're going to be ready. Everything's laid out. As soon as you slide that patient in the aircraft, while the partner's buttoning it up, if you're in the one inside, you're putting all that stuff on, and you're out of here. It all... Is dependent on having stuff that is readily accessible and works. If it doesn't work, that's not the time to troubleshoot something. Do you, do you feel like you had that attitude working on the ambulance before you were flying? I think I'm that way. I think they call it obsessive compulsive disorder. <laughs> <laughs> but I will let you use that word or <laughs> that phrase. But I've always been sort of like that, yeah. And but um, maybe not to that extent, but certainly uh, some of it, yeah. Early lesson in EMS, we went and picked this patient up, and in those days we had BVMs that were not disposable they cost three hundred dollars a piece they were silicon rubber made by laridol they were expensive and when you used one you had to clean it and we came in on volunteer shift and somebody said we had to use the bvm it's sitting on the, the counter there it's out drying which to me means it's ready to go right it's just drying what they had neglected to point out was that they took the valve out of it so and out drying. And then we went out on a call that coded 17-year-old kid who walked into his parents' room, living room, which I can still remember that to this day, probably the whitest carpet I'd ever seen and started throwing up blood. <laughs> and we couldn't ventilate him. 
that was a cluster. And no, your stuff needs to be ready to go usable always. And what they said was true, but they neglected to tell us they didn't reassemble it. How would you approach your gear every shift? I think, at least for me, and other people might not be true, but I'm a creature of habit. I think we all are. Yeah. Anyone <laughs> anyone in EMS in any capacity, I think, likes things the way they So, are. you know, I always go out and check everything in the same way, in the same fashion, every day. There's no... And you check everything, make sure you pull it all out, make sure it works. Again, once you get roadside and you need it, it's not the time to wonder if it works. <laughs> Did you have anything like that happen flying? Um, I can't say. We've had equipment break, but not because we missed it on inventory. <laughs> and that's a great thing. That's the way it should be. Things do break. Somebody drops something, and you go, <gasps> you know, everybody's heart stops because you got one of them, and you're out how far away from home, and then probably don't have equipment that you're checked out on to borrow, but yes, we've done that too because <laughs> we needed something. And you briefly mentioned it, but when the program was based at the main hospital and you were – on the eighth floor, always launching from the helipad. How would you utilize being in the hospital? Would you wander around and see different things? Would you go to different units and try to learn things? Was that encouraged? Yeah, yeah was that I definitely discouraged? do some uh, stuff like that. We were not a, have a clinical assignment, although the hospital, and particularly the nursing department, tried to come back to that repeatedly, but. It, it really was not practical, and it showed up when we did that. But you were, had uh, freedom, leeway to go work, go in another unit and hang out and work or help and learn stuff. Yeah, that was awesome. We went up, Joey and I went up and said, well, you know what? <laughs> L&D is not my strong suit. <laughs> Let's go up to L&D tonight. And we went up and birthed four babies, and that was awesome. Just they just let you step right in. Not exactly, <laughs> <laughs> but we went up there and participated in four deliveries. Yeah, and uh, it was great. Um, but you know, we had a and we we didn't get a call that night, so we were up there all night long in L and D and had four deliveries. That was, and they all went. You know, it shouldn't be any problem, right? And they all were. None of them had any problem. Mm -hmm. And that was just, you know, that was great. Over the years, um, what type of situations made you learn the most? And what I mean by that, for me, I always felt like or feel like I learn the most when I drop a patient off and I stay for a minute and watch what the hospital does or watch some of the initial interventions of the physician. What, um, what situations do you feel like you learn the most? Great question. I think you learn the most, and, and one of my colleagues from there once said that it was the challenge of figuring it all out and how to deal with it. Because there, especially early on, there were a lot of very new experiences. You had the challenge of figuring out what was actually going on with the patient versus what we were told, and then what are we going to do about it. I think hands-on learning is fantastic. But do you really want to do all of this? There's some times when you're out there doing hands-on learning Maybe this is not the best way to do this. <laughs> and this is where simulation comes in in this day and age. You know, you can go in and create situations like that. Um, and I think in that regard, the training is a lot better than what we did. It was great to go out there and have to do that stuff. But there are a lot of times I'm like, 
Hmm. I'm not sure this is the best plan. So follow up afterwards is huge. How would you guys get it? Well, we uh, in the early days we were required to give feedback because remember this is one of these things we're building up, extending the reach of the hospital. These people send their patients up. They don't ever know what happened to them. They wonder. They wonder if they did a good job with the patient. Um, and so we would actually write letters back to individual people and tell them how their patient did. Part of our job was the entire time that patient was in the hospital, next shift we worked, we were supposed to go check on them and write a letter and keep up with them for their entire duration in the hospital. Some of them stayed for you know six months. Right, I'm thinking about some of the patients specifically in the burn unit yeah they're there a long time yeah and you but you and that you know they're going to be there and and that's good for them to find to get a letter every so often to say he's still here making good progress he's only got x number of surgeries left <laughs> you know it's but you know you couldn't ever do that this day and it was really questionable in those days when we did it too but you could never do that now. It'd be a huge HIPAA violation. <laughs> what What were some of the innovations that came along the way? You know, now, air care and other programs, for example, do point of care ultrasound. Mm -hmm. Looking back at your career, what are some of those milestone innovations that came, and how were they implemented? Well, the equipment got better, and then we got multi function monitors which was huge and then uh, Siemens which is the original company developed the mini med and it had three channels on one pump like oh and very small it took up less space than one pump did and you could run three and as soon as we saw that and it was actually developed for transport and once we saw that we were like well, we'll test it, but we're going to buy that because <laughs> that is – and uh, Mission, who trained with us, was first ones to use it. And we saw that one night, and we chatted them up. They were already using it, field testing it, basically. So as soon as we got it, we field tested it. Everybody, like, yeah, this is it. It wasn't a perfect because there was always a little trouble getting the bubbles out of the cassette. But still, it was so much better than my – Things come along. We got a, you know, the uh, bloom pump. We had an old 8384, which probably people don't even know they had numbers that low. But it was had its own behemoth machine that sat under a special cart. And you put the, put the stretcher on top of it. Your bloom pump was, you know, it was like a quagmire to get that thing in there. And then you got the 90T, T for transport. <laughs> <laughs> and it was almost automatic before we used to have to do the timing. Yeah, balloon pumps specifically, there was probably an era when they weren't portable enough to be flown. And then so once that became even an option, what was that like? Well, we really never flew the 90 TD in there while I was there because of various and sundry reasons. But... um Yes, we could put it in a truck and and go get that, which was its own little thing because we weren't really ground oriented at that time. We, that took some getting used to, to be honest. We came to be flight people. Don't put us in a truck, you know. And it's sad to say, but that's kind of where we lived, you know. That's why we were there to to fly, and we wanted to fly, and that's. But yeah, we did some ground. We did ground from time to time, but it was hardly a, a focus. And and now it's a much needed resource, and it's um, still in short supply. Because mm -hmm. there's at night, there's not a lot of people you can call for ground critical care. Mm -hmm. As the program grew and more aircraft were added, that has obvious 
implications when you spread a staff out, you know, to the, um, you just don't get to see everybody as much, but, um, how did that change? It's one of those things that's going to change your, at least for us, the entire makeup, very tight group. You can't, you know, you worked out of the same building, the same aircraft, not a large group, small, tight. And now you start putting people out there. You're going to lose some of that close knitness and the feeling that you belong to a single organization. The further you get distance from the mothership, you know, look what happened in the United States colonies (laughs) (laughs) when you had this big pond separating you from King George. We started thinking that maybe we should be in charge of ourselves. And we didn't like paying taxes to people. So, still a problem, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you, when you separate that, it, you lose some of that. And then you, the bases will develop their own identity, which is different from central. And that's going to happen. As you get bigger, you you know that's going to happen. What can you do to keep them more or less feel like they belong to the same large unit and you don't get one base complaining about another base because they didn't take this call, <laughs> you know? And that's a challenge. That's a real challenge to feel like they buy. Do they need to all have the same identity? That's really the first question, too. Can Is it okay for them to have... Uh, a base and there's some pluses to that real because they have a certain camaraderie that you had with your own little group before that's a good thing Mm -hmm. but they can't be they got to still talk to the to the mothership Mm -hmm. (laughs) and feel like they're part of the overall arching program that's that's a real challenge yeah someone I talked to spoke to the close-knit feeling when there was one base on the eighth floor and um, just a smaller staff. Of mm-hmm. course, you're going to know everybody. You know everybody very well. And I would imagine there's a lot of shared experiences, too. Mm-hmm. What uh, Would you end up basically working with everyone? Yeah. Yeah. And so you knew all these folks, too. And you know what's going on in their lives, you know. They're married. They have kids. What's going on with them? You know, because you you're there working with you, particularly on a twenty four hour shift here. You know, so it, it's um, that's, but that's a different world, and that world is gone. And it's not coming back. <laughs> yeah, as things evolve, you know, EMS and helicopter EMS and critical care transport. Obviously, the technology mm. is going to keep improving. And it's it's in warp speed. You know, we do, can do echo in the truck. I mean, a, a, echo ECMO and transport portable ECMO machine. I like that just almost mind-boggling. What do you think are some of the timeless things that are not going to change? Hmm. Well, Humans. I don't think we can AI a healthcare provider. <laughs> and the quality of the work and the compassion delivered, the caring, that's going to be needed. And uh, integrity. I don't think that'll ever change. I think what will change, and it's already started that way, is. Every single thing you do will be monitored somewhere. That's good and bad, and both. It's good because now you can hopefully keep track of everything, improve. It puts tremendous pressure on you that sometimes is not necessary. So, yeah. Did you really get that done in that amount of time uh, you know and you didn't meet now you start having parameters set you know it'll be you can make a job 
if you monitor it so closely like that, untenable. And I see that's a concern, actually, that everything you do from the moment the pager goes off, you know, you, you have GPS tracking on you, you'll have a camera, you know, your body cam. It's all recorded. When you mention integrity, I think we're all raised with a sense of what that word means, but specific to EMS, critical care, helicopter EMS, what does integrity look like? Integrity is doing the things that you should do when they need to be done. And if you mess up, owning up to it. You're not going to be perfect. That's the bottom line. But you also don't you know, go beyond the scope of practice. <laughs> and and thing, I mean, that's pretty easy and straightforward. But... Um, you know, the best definition of integrity I've liked to quote is, is what you do when no one's looking. <laughs> and if you're working out there, particularly because uh, you need, and you this will happen to you in this business, you're going to find yourself in a situation where you will need somebody to believe you. Absolutely. And if you have been that way all along they will believe you they'll give you the benefit of the doubt if you've had question marks on along the way it'll be a question mark and that was um important because when we're doing training with people i need to know what you're going to do out there you're in this fishbowl you're in this uniform i have to depend on you i will back you up basically to my own detriment if i believe you are right but you got to be right. <laughs> and you got to tell me everything. Yeah, that is a phenomenal leadership tenant um, example. And for both, I think, for both leaders and people working in an organization, trust and integrity are foundational. Yeah, and I see that eroding in a lot of things. But this job... It's a basic tenet. You've got to have it. Or, because you're going to, you need it. Again, you'll find yourself in a position where you'll need somebody to believe you. And thank God they did have. <laughs> and I was always appreciated. Like, no, this is what I saw. <laughs> thank you. And they went to bat for you. Like, wow. And then when you get in that position, you've got to return that. Yeah, as the program continued to grow and you gained experience, what did training and mentorship look like for you? I didn't do a lot of the training, uh, like, far as I'm his preceptor. But we always, anytime somebody new comes in, we're all training them. The person has a preceptor and a primary one, and has we had a, a training officer. We did not have the training education setup we have now, which is phenomenal. Actually, we have actual positions and people hired into them. But you, I don't think you could uh, justify the expense in those days with a smaller program. But now, as you get expanded out. You've got to have do something different from what you're doing. That's awesome. We got this great training program, but we did have a tr person that was the training officer, and they primarily responsible. And we set them up with a preceptor, and but then everybody's precepting them, you know, because um, you've got to. You got again. You have to know what they're thinking. Yeah. I, I think there is a tendency in all agencies to put the responsibility of training somebody on one person. And so when they're both living and dying by that one person's success, almost, 
Um, and that can be really good, and it can be absolutely horrible with one person if it's not a good match. Or some people, I don't, I'm not sure you can please them. <laughs> you know, and you'd have to be extraordinarily good to get through under that person. But you do need a focus point. I think there has to be a, a primary focus for training somebody. And this is the person where all the information goes to. Um, but you need other people to train this person because you need different perspectives on them. If that one person is and get, indeed un- cannot satisfy them, it's good to have other people say, no, I didn't see that. It's not that serious. Sir. But you have to have the right preceptors. And I think that's key. If I was somebody starting out, I said the thing that you need to do is get the best preceptor you can get. Because <laughs> somebody that's really good at that is worth their weight in gold. And they're nurturing. They'll bring you up. There's some people that are... Unfortunately, very type A and hell bent on weeding people out if they can. And that's not the way you train. There are people that, if you've put that effort into them, especially in a hiring process, to hire them, you've already validated so many things already if you've done your job in hiring them. Now is the time to nurture them and get them to bloom and be successful. If you have questions about them being successful, you should never have hired them to start with. That's, that is on you. I agree. Through your career, I'm sure you've seen not just air care, but multiple organizations go through ups and downs, mm-hmm. leadership changes and struggles, Things high cycle. times, low times. What do you tell people that have maybe never experienced something like that and their organization is going through a, a, a valley path, yeah. or a peak. Uh, it's hard for them to see that because they haven't, you know, they're at the, going down the valley. But you have to keep focus on why, why are you here? Yeah, what was that for you? Oh, I was here because it was the best job in the world. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I remember, particularly the first group of people, they were so, so great people. And it can be that good. And that's the thing you have to keep in mind, Keep have some vision of what... It can be incredible. You can work with these great people, and you can have some really good experiences. You can do, sometimes, real good, you know? And you get paid money, too, on top of that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's a double bonus. You, you know, so it's... But, you, you know, you have to... Again, people why, do people... why do people come to a job or leave? Well, there's a couple of things, and money is not at the top of the list. It's probably not even four or five. It's... Work environment's number one. So does this work environment, is it right for you? And there are times like, well, you have this person in charge. They're kind of like that. That's not going to probably change too much. And they're going to be there a while. You have to decide whether that continue to be the right place for you. Are you getting what you need? I can't tell you the right answer to that. You have to decide that. That's what I tell them. But things do cycle. Things go up and down, and when you change somebody out, what happens? Man, sometimes it's awesome. A book, sir, hospitals are really getting into a situation and organizations where 
they can't afford these very difficult personalities. Particularly, for instance, comes to mind these gold brick, I won't say the gold brick, but sometimes surgeons who with their big ego and, you know, throw themselves around, even throw, you know, instruments down in the OR. And that's true. That's, there are people who've seen certain surgeons do that on multiple occasions. So this is not acceptable behavior. And there's a book that, um, it's a very short read, and it's called The No Asshole Rule. And the synopsis is that you can have these people that have tremendous skills and ability, and they're so disruptive that the work environment is terrible. And productivity actually drops. And it's measured by the fact that when that person leaves, you see productivity go up. So you should keep in mind, you you can be replaced. <laughs> and that's a humbling thing, but you should always remember that in the back of your mind, you can be replaced. And that will drive, all of a sudden, things crystallize for you. So when you go through... Um, a tough patch and you have things you just remember what is it important to you and you're not you can be replaced <laughs> so don't pitch too big a fit <laughs> don't be a horses behind <laughs> you may be very unhappy we'll sit down and talk to you about why you're unhappy and we want you to be happy but in the end i can't make you happy you, you're the only one that can do that well, as new people are entering the profession of EMS, you know, COVID saw a lot of people leave. And with that, I think there's also a lot of new people choosing it. I know just at my old job that I came from, I can think of two to three people that COVID showed them they wanted to work in healthcare in some form or fashion, mm -hmm. and they chose EMS. So I think where I'm going with that is there's a level of turnover in our industry. Some people exiting, some people coming in. That's maybe a little more than normal. I don't know. With that as the backdrop, what advice would you have for people entering EMS? It's a challenging job. And uh, the pay is decent. I think the, the pay will have to get better. Or you'll see a lot of people as they're doing continue to go into EMS and then go into a better pacing job which is similar but different that's nursing but for us to get better pay we have to be quite frankly become more professional and we have we're a very new organization we have not been around as long as nursing and not made inroads into different things and that's the big challenge for EMS we have to grow as a profession and you can be part of that come in and may help make it grow what would you, you know there's lots that needs to be done biggest thing we need in our job is research on what we're doing and how well we're doing it but it's a great job I, I you know and you get to do some fun stuff and you get to think on your feet and yes, you're working off a protocol, but our protocols with standing order now are way different than they used to be. And that gives you a lot more latitude, you know. But, we, you know, working as a single mech on the north side and doing what was reasonable and prudent, I had a lot of latitude there. <laughs> and that was nice. I enjoyed that. Because you, you know, you, I won't say you practice in medicine, but you, you know, you're getting out there to do work somewhat independently, which is good and bad both. But there are, with the challenges in healthcare growing and what we do grow out in the field is going to change. You know, ultrasound, I think, you know, one day we're going to have your 
Star Trek tricorder out there. And you're going to hold it over the patient. It's going to tell you all everything you need. You can kind of do that with EKGs now. You know, wireless. And they're looking at wireless blood pressure machines and everything else. So there's... It's a, the technology is going to change. I, one reason I went back and worked for a while is I think at this point with the changes in, in healthcare and technology, once you're out of the game, you're out. Three or four years, you're, you're just going to be out of date. <laughs> You'll have to be retrained practically. That's interesting because I think there's a yin and a yang because I also tell people the most important tool you have is between your ears. Indeed, this and is true. You can't, technology can't replace it. No, and AI can't either. But uh, but you, there'll be technology out there that if you get out of the game, you're not going to be able to run or take advantage of. And you're going to have to be retrained. And wow. <laughs> and you'll be, you know, you, you get out, you're going to be obsolete in a few years. <laughs> and that's, maybe that's, that's great because if we're moving that fast, but anytime change happens that fast, it presents a lot of problems, most of them ethical. <laughs> I can't thank you enough. Um, thank you for your time. Well, thank you. I hopefully it's been beneficial. I, I rambled a lot, but um, it's not rambling. It's wisdom. As Jay and I used to say, we were geezing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's wisdom. I think um, I think people that are listening to this and newer in this profession or not newer in this profession, there's always something to learn from people that have been doing it. Um, and have been there. Yeah. And when you're younger, sometimes you just sort of disregard that. And as you get older, you're like, wow, that's kind of good stuff there. Dean Hottie used to say, he, he got this quote somewhere, and he's our sensing feeling medic. <laughs> you need one of those. <laughs> and he said... Uh, when an old person dies, it's like a library burning down. I'm like, yeah, there's a lot of experience and there that's gone, and there's no way to replace it. Well, again, thank you so much. Again, thank you for having me.